Ryan Robinson. We're going to be talking about TV humor. That'll be downstairs in the sunroom at 8 o'clock. This afternoon, we have Leland Pogue with us, and he's a member of the staff here at Iowa State for the last two years. And with that, I'm just going to give you Leland Pogue, and he'll explain what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, I think they invited me to speak to you tonight to cover the area of cinema in the larger province of the subject of humor. Now, in certain respects, I've devoted much of the last decade to preparing this talk. Nevertheless, the time I've had to put my remarks together, like the time I am given to deliver them, imposes certain practical limits on the comprehensiveness of my discussion of film comedy. Another factor which limits the comprehensiveness of this discussion, however, is a certain skepticism on my part about the usefulness of large-scale categories such as humor and comedy. The more I study the subject of film comedy, for example, the clearer it becomes to me that precise definitions or theories of the genre as a whole are difficult, if not impossible, to come by. Likewise, it is also becoming clear to me that large-scale definitions are primarily useful to the degree that they help us to read specific texts or works, or in this instance a film, with greater attention to their particular patterns of resonance and implication. Accordingly, I thought it would be interesting and useful if I devoted my prepared remarks to the discussion of a single, though clearly representative, comic film, a film which is furthermore typical of a neglected subgenre of film comedy, that is, the comic short. In discussing it, I want to demonstrate that it is possible to take seriously the notion that there might be a rhetoric of slapstick, that even early comic films may demonstrate recognizable patterns of structure and implication. And if that's true, then it will no longer be possible to write off short comedies as mere exercises leading up to the feature films which we normally think about when we think of the comic cinema. The film I want to screen and discuss is The Tramp. Its director and star is Charlie Chaplin, and I give you Mr. Chaplin for the moment. I keep the lights off, except for the one behind me, because the talk will be illustrated with slides, slides largely involving scenes that you did not see. Uh, this is an incomplete, although I think it is by now the standard version of the tram. But I have seen other prints and have taken slides from those prints, and there are certain sequences which are missing and which are interesting. So as I go, Professor Tadlock, my colleague in the English department, is going to uh, help me get this stuff straight up on the screen. The tramp is popularly accorded a privileged position in the Chaplin canon. It is his first film specifically as The Tramp, a character which developed into an archetype in Chaplin's later shorts and in most of his features, though it was not the first film to find Charlie impoverished and at loose ends. It is the first film, furthermore, wherein Chaplin's comedy is counterpoised with an element of pathos, a juxtaposition which became a virtual signature in Chaplin's later films. And it is also the first film wherein we see the marvelously evocative image of Charlie marching down that metaphoric road, which will wind its way in various forms so memorably through the vagabond, the adventurer, the pilgrim, the gold rush, the circus, and modern times. But it is not the firstness of any of these elements which matters so much as the way each of them is integrated into the larger structure and logic of the film. It is frequently observed, for example, that the long shot of Charlie walking down the road occurs not once in the film, but twice. It is both the first and last shot. And some critics take this to evidence a basic principle of circularity in the film's structure of incident. Indeed, Gerald Mast has gone so far as to suggest that the film involves a sort of mirror image construction in which everything, as he puts it, happens twice. Two setbacks, two sacrifices, two acts of loyalty, two experiences of pain. Now, it must be said that Mast's recollections and descriptions of the film are inaccurate and imprecise in certain important respects, and that's a vice that all film critics are heir to, so I claim no <coughs> innocence here. Charlie, as Mast, uh, in the film you have seen, and in some shots from, from uh, other prints I've seen, suffers the following sequence. Twice he is almost run over by automobiles, his sandwich is stolen, he falls seat first into a campfire, the farmhand steps on his knuckles and later knocks him down with a flour sack. The farm girl not only refuses to eat dinner with him, 
but she insists that he do his chores, is incapable of understanding his gestures of endearment, and she inadvertently, if prophetically, smashes some eggs which Charlie had hidden in his front pants pockets. Charlie then falls into the clutches of his rival tramps. He gets shot in the leg by the farmer as he chases the hobos from the farmyard. And Charlie finally has to watch as the farm girl leaves, ministering to him, and embraces her dapper and big-chested boyfriend, at which point Charlie's short-lived dream of sexual contentment is shattered. And it is not at all clear from mass discussion of the comic mind which of these various and numerous setbacks are the two which count in his description. Or, put another way, if Charlie's being shot and being jilted are, as Walter Kerr suggests, the setbacks which matter most, then the mere image or full circle notion falls apart. The two events come one right after the other in the last few moments of the, of the film. But to reject Mass' notion that the tramp inscribes an exact circle such that each action in its first half is precisely mirrored in its second half does not require that we reject the more general observation that circularity is a structuring principle in the tramp, both in large scale terms, as evidenced in the pairing of the first and last shots, and in small scale terms, as evidenced in specific uh, patterns of action and in specific gag routines. Indeed, actions in the film repeatedly turn back upon themselves. Characters go up and down the road, go across the road and back, go from barn to hen house and back again, go up and down various ladders or staircases, etc., etc. Indeed, Charlie frequently uses circular patterns of movement to his advantage in confronting the hobos who steal his sandwich and try unsuccessfully to steal the farm girl's grocery money. Thus, after Charlie clunks the first hobo on the head with his brick-weighted bundle, Charlie circles the tree, comes up behind his adversary, and delivers a well-timed kick in the seat. And when the second hobo makes his move, Charlie slowly circles the tree again, keeping it between the hobo and himself, and then delivers a swinging blow with his bundle. A blow which is preceded, however, by a warm-up routine wherein Charlie inscribes an elaborate circle in the air with his arm. Another kind of circularity is evident in various gag sequences. Excuse me, let's get this right. An early and elementary example of this involves the brick, which the first hobo substitutes for the sandwich he steals from Charlie's kerchief. Now, this was not in what you saw, but it explains why that brick was, why that, that bundle was so lethal. Uh, the the uh, first hobo substitutes a brick for Charlie's sandwich while Charlie is polishing a knife on his shoe sole, which he will then use to clean his fingernails. The cutting of the film in prints which preserve the sequence is such that we never see Charlie direct, directly register the fact of the brick. Indeed, later on, Charlie is so energized by his triumphs over the hobos that he attempts to demonstrate his technique to the farm girl and proceeds to clunk himself silly as if he had forgotten or were unaware that his bundle was loaded. But there is a certain appropriate circularity to the fact that the hobos are defeated by a weapon of their own making. Another circular gag sequence, unfortunately cut short and rendered meaningless in some 16 millimeter television prints of the film, involves Charlie's attempts to play the role of farmhand once the farmer's daughter out of gratitude brings him home. The farmer takes Charlie outside, hands him a pitchfork and motions in the direction of the barn. Charlie takes the pitchfork enthusiastically, as if he were an old hand with such implements, and promptly stabs the farmer in the foot. Exasperated, the farmer instructs Charlie to carry the pitchfork over his shoulder, but in doing so, Charlie only succeeds in turning it around and clunking the farmer on the head. So begins the gag, with Charlie assaulting the farmer. The middle section of the gag, running some 30 shots in length, involves variations on the pitchfork routine, including, at one point, an instance where Charlie pitchforks a farmhand, causing him to drop a grain sack on the farmer standing below. And the gag comes full circle then when the farmer clobbers the farmhand in the rear with a stick, causing him to drop yet another grain sack, which lands promptly and appropriately on Charlie's head. As you give, so shall you receive, at least in this instance. Another sort of circulation in the, in the film involves the circulation of objects. Two such objects I have already discussed, the brick and the grain sacks. Other objects which, objects which circulate in a similar manner through the world of the film include Charlie's hobo bundle and various farm implements, the pitchfork, a watering pail, a milk bucket, the ladder which Charlie moves from barn to hen house and back, the oversized mallet which Charlie intends to use on the hobos who plan to burglarize the farm, but which he first uses on the farmhand from whence it circulates to the farmer and finally back to Charlie, 
One could include here the bullets which fly when the hobos and the farmers exchange fire. It's one of those bullets which catches Charlie in the leg. And one could also include here the farewell note that Charlie pens just before hitting the road again. But clearly the most important object which circulates through the world of the tramp is legal tender, money. The issue of the relationship between wealth and social stature is raised early in the film, when Charlie is nearly run over twice by touring cars. Each car appro approaches Charlie, more or less, from the back, from one direction, and then once Charlie is spun around from the next, so that Charlie gets it quite literally both coming and going. And the contrast between the potentially lethal fact of wealth and Charlie's pathetic yet playful attempts to appear wealthy through his costume and gestures serves as a thematically relevant prologue to the film's two major actions, both of which center on money. Indeed, for the most part, they center on a single roll of bills which passes from one pair of hands to the next. We first see the money in a shot cut from some 16 millimeter prints in the fourth shot of what I take to be the film's original continuity when the farmer hands the money to his daughter who appears to be going to market. We next see her and the money as she stops in a meadow path where she appears to be counting on her fingers. We then get a close-up of the tramp who stole Charlie's sandwich, a shot of Charlie eating grass instead of the sandwich, and, then, and we then cut to the sequence of the thief throwing down the sandwich and grabbing for the farm girl's money. He misses, she runs to Charlie, and Charlie dispatch, dispatches the thief. Charlie then sees the bills, does some figuring of his own on his palm, and steals the money for himself. Upon seeing her reaction, however, he gives all the bills back. At this point, the second tramp appears and takes the bills while Charlie circles the tree. Charlie then clunks him on the head. The thug, thug staggers and then shifts the bills quite obtrusively from one hand to the other so Charlie can take the money and return it to the farm girl. One more attempt is made on the money by the third of the three tramps as Charlie and the girl are evidently on their way to market an attempt which Charlie once again foils before the money can change hands. No more is then seen of the money until after Charlie has wrecked havoc with his pitchfork. We then observe the farmer in the house counting his assets while the three hobo tramps peer in through the front door and while Charlie, outside, prepares to have another go at doing the farm chores. Charlie does his best to do what is asked of him, to milk the cow, gather eggs, etc., and in the midst of it, he runs into the other tramps, who promise to split the sway with him if Charlie will help with the burglary. Charlie agrees, but sets about subsequently to spoil their plans to ensure that the farmer will keep his money and hence, by implication, his farm. Money makes one further appearance in the film, though in this last instance, the money is not the farmer's and the money itself does not circulate. After Charlie sees the farm girl embrace her sweetheart, he goes into the house, writes his note, wipes his tears on the farm girl's hat, and on a hand towel which hangs on the back of the front door, and then he walks to a three-shot with the girl and her fiancé. With considerable dignity, he bids the farm girl adieu, at which point the fiancé, who seems genuinely moved by Charlie's self-evident courage, quite generously offers Charlie some money. Charlie looks at it thoughtfully and says in a title, no thanks. There is not a hint of malice or resentment or condescension in either the offer or in its refusal, though Charlie's gesture is clearly one of great integrity. But the point to make here is that the presence of money in this scene completes yet another of the film's circular patterns and helps us to see the kind of general significance which the whole web of such patterns may be said to carry. The chief characteristic of almost all of the various patterns of circularity which overlap and intersect through the course of the tramp is that nearly all of them involve and embody human relationships. The repeated actions are clearly human actions. The circulating objects circulate among human beings. The concept of society in the tramp is therefore defined in almost materialist terms as a system of exchange. Blows are exchanged. Insults are traded. Endearments are offered, some to be rejected, others accepted. Objects pass from hand to hand. And the paradigm case of exchange as a social medium is represented by the recurrent appearance of money, which is nothing but an abstract marker for more concrete exchanges of the sort which the film effectively catalogs. One further cycle in the film remains to, be remar remains to be remarked upon here, the cycle of nature. Two systems of reference raise the issue. In the first of these, Charlie is constantly associated in the film with natural elements, fire and water especially. 
He carries a tin of water with him on the road, for example. He chases the other tramps into the river. He seeks relief for his singed posterior by sitting in an open drain pipe. He uses a watering can first to drench the crotch of his fellow farmhand and then to water a grove of trees. And he recovers from his wounds, and as he recovers from his wounds, he plays with a seltzer bottle. Fire imagery comes likewise into play when Charlie lands seat first in the hobo's campfire, and later when Charlie uses a candle to warm the chin of the farmhand and then to set fire to the farmer's newspaper. On two other occasions, furthermore, Charlie is closely associated with grass or foliage. He eats grass when his sandwich is stolen, and he stuffs his pocket with leaves after the farm girl smashes the egg in his pants. Secondly, Charlie is constantly associated with sexuality and procreation, both human and animal. Thus, as we have seen, Charlie is associated with eggs. On two occasions, when Charlie is helping the farmhand move the grain sacks, and later after the farm girl, Charles, after the farm girl calls Charlie in to do the milking. Likewise, the milking incident itself raises the issue of reproduction. The first animal Charlie thinks about milking is a bull. And the cow he subsequently has to deal with seems to have done the job herself, as if she were an old hand at generating mother's milk. More obviously, sexuality is connoted by Charlie's affection for the farm girl, as it is expressed in his willingness to protect her from the hobos and in his willingness to resign in favor of her sweetheart. <coughs> Finally, the issue of sexuality is also invoked by frequent allusions to male genitals. On several occasions, for example, Charlie pulls out the front of his baggy pants and looks downward, ostensibly to check the scrawny quality of his undernourished waistline, but also by implication to call attention to a quality of sexual hunger. Similarly, when the farmhand plays a joke with Charlie, handing him a watering pail and telling him to water the trees, Charlie responds by soaking the farmhand's crotch. Later, of course, Charlie has his eggs smashed by the farm girl, a moment of unmistakable sexual implication, which looks forward to and prepares the way for the farm girl's effective, if unintended, rejection of Charlie. Furthermore, the film is replete with phallic objects or projectiles, rocks, pitchforks, candles, pistols, rifles, bullets, etc. It is not too much, indeed, to see Charlie's leg wound as a sexual wound. And we can also see sexual implications in many of the various rear-end gags, to threaten someone's buttocks is implicitly to threaten his or her genitals. In certain important respects, then, we may characterize the thematic aspect of the tramp as reflecting upon the relationship between culture or society, as it is embodied in the systems or circuits of exchange, and nature, as represented by references to reproductive cycles and natural processes. But the opposition is far from simple. The whole point of using a farm as a setting, for example, is that farms are exactly dedicated to turning nature, eggs and milk, fruits and vegetables, into culture. The raw becomes the cooked, as it were. Hence the importance in the film and in Chaplin generally of food, which serves both as a source of the farmer's prosperity and as an alternative system of exchange. It tells us something of the richness of the filmic system of the tramp, furthermore, that Charlie's character belongs in some sense to both worlds of experience. Charlie's relationship to nature is remarkably social, for example. He tips his hat to rocks, to cows, to chickens, as if all were a part of the high society to which Charlie aspires. On the other hand, however, Charlie is too lively and animated, too natural, to fit permanently into the social system represented by the society of the farmstead. Thus, for example, Charlie seems incapable of using tools only as tools. He constantly extends and transforms their functions so that they become in his hands toys to be played with, opportunities to explore. Hence, Charlie's extended pitchfork routine, for example, and also the marvelous watering ballet, watering pail ballet in the orange grove. This goes on for a very long shot for Chaplin. Charlie moves back and forth amongst the trees, trying to water all of them with this one pail. But the pitchfork routine tells us something else as well, that the fertility of Charlie's imagination has a dangerous aspect to it as evidenced by the way Charlie continually assaults the farmhand. Not cruelly, but as if unable to conceive of negative consequences or, or physical pain of the sort evidenced by the farmhand's quite explicitly mimed responses. Perhaps the most curious example in the film of the degree to which Charlie's liveliness is somehow inconsistent with the society he momentarily inhabits is the otherwise inexplicable sequence missing from some prints where Charlie and the farmhand encounter a poet or poetry lover who stands at a fence reciting to no one in particular. The character is seen nowhere else in the film and his presence seems so inappropriate that we applaud Charlie when he decides to drop a rotten egg directly into the man's open book. 
Indeed, the man is so caught up in reverie that he doesn't notice the egg until he hugs the book to his chest and gets a good whiff. But the society of the farm is a society of writing, of printed money, of newspapers, of magazines. The farm girl is reading to Charlie when her sweetheart arrives. At which point we understand, as Charlie understands, that the most social thing he can do is to write a heartfelt but misspelt farewell note before leaving the farm forever. We began with Charlie walking down the road. We conclude with Charlie walking down the road. And in retrospect, we can see that Charlie's dilemma in The Tramp has very much to do with the issue of motion or movement. Is the structure of the farm, both spatially and socially, capable of assimilating Charlie's constant motion? Or is Charlie too lively and animated for his own good and the farm's? Clearly, the ability to keep moving is constantly at hazard in The Tramp. Witness the constant pratfalls and especially the obsessively repeated gags involving feet. People are always tripping over things, stepping into things, or constantly finding their feet poked with pitchforks or assaulted by rocks or mallets. Indeed, every kick threatens the kicker as well as the kicky for putting his kicking foot at hazard, as the farmer discovers, for example, when he kicks the farmhand in the rear, only, connect, only to connect with the mallet which the farmhand, farmhand holds behind his back. All of which is connected metaphorically to the issue of the survival of the farm by the fact that the farmer keeps his savings in an old sock. This is not one, not a, a shot of this which was in your print, but you did see this in the shot early on when the farm, farmer gives his daughter the money. If the hobos were to steal the money, they would be cutting the farmer's financial feet right out from under him. On the other hand, there is a sense in which too much movement is equally dangerous. We see this clearly enough in the way that Charlie plays havoc with the work routine of the farm. The point is sum summed up when Charlie receives his wound. That is, Charlie gets shot, not because of any enmity on the farmer's part, but because Charlie's whirlwind energy is contagious. While Charlie sets out mallet in hand to chase the hobos who have already left the yard, the farmer in his upstairs windows keeps firing in all directions. Charlie gets shot because he runs into the field of fire, not because the farmer is aiming at him. The ironic quality of the film's conclusion is not therefore, a, not therefore a function of simple Charlie didn't get the girl pathos. It is rather the case that Charlie's not getting the girl is emblematic of a greater though equally painful disjunction between the self-contained circularity of the farm, the sense in which movement there is defined by economic routine and by social ritual, and the more expansive and playful quality of movement associated with Charlie. It is not a matter of clear-cut opposition. The values of vitality and resiliency which Charlie celebrates in their immediacy are celebrated in more refined and more long-range terms by the farm and by the prospect of the match between the farm girl and her sweetheart. In both cases, the concern is to find and maintain an appropriate balance of culture and nature, of stability and energy. The problem is simply that Charlie is out of step, quite literally, with the society of the farmstead. He moves in the same direction, as it were, but at a different pace. The gap narrows through the course of the film. At the beginning of the tramp, it is, it is an implicitly urban society in the form of two touring cars, which is too fast for Charlie. For a time, at least, especially after receiving the leg wound, Charlie slows down enough to appreciate the pace of rural existence. But it is quite clearly, <coughs> excuse me, but it is quite clearly not in Charlie's nature as a clown to stay seated and stationary for long. To be fully himself, he must eventually get up and leave. The entrance of the boyfriend only provides the opportunity. His leaving is not easy, either for Charlie or his friends, but the pathos of the conclusion is an implicit recognition, on our part and on that of the farmsteaders as well, that Charlie matters, that the values implied by his vagabond lifestyle are powerfully relevant even for those of us who live a settled existence. Indeed, the cutting of the last sequence implies an identity of perspective. We get a point of view shot as the girl reads Charlie's note, a three shot as she shows it to her father and her boyfriend, and then we get the long shot of Charlie in the road seen from behind. It's almost as if the farmsteaders were watching Charlie leave, as if they had become appreciative spectators like ourselves. Accordingly, Charlie's final gesture, slowing down almost to a stop, and then reclaiming his stride by trying out his hitch kick, is a genuinely comic gesture in context for assuring us, and by implication the farmsteaders, that Charlie's sense of self has not been diminished, but has been both reborn and enhanced, ready once again to face the next comic adventure with a deepened sense of vitality and purpose. Furthermore, neither we nor the farm folks are left totally empty-handed at Charlie's departure. 
the circuits of exchange are not totally broken. To the farm folks, Charlie leaves his farewell note, which can be understood in context as, sim as symbolic of independence, but also of relationship, that is to say, of his respect for the farm girl and her family, and also of his membership, however tenuous, in the culture of the word which is associated with the farm. And to us, Charlie, the director, leaves another icon, both of selfhood and sociality, the film. As Walter Kerr points out in The Silent Clowns, Chaplin's discovery of his tramp costume was simultaneously with his discovery of the camera and, by implication, his audience. Both discoveries occurred in connection with Chaplin's second keystone film, Kid Auto Races at Venice. In The Tramp, the character-camera relationship is continued by frequent moments when one character or another explicitly acknowledges the camera. Thus, after he's knocked down in the road, Charlie gets up and calls silently toward the camera. In the succeeding medium shot, he looks into the camera as he brushes himself off. And both Charlie and the farmhand accompany their comic pratfalls with quite explicitly into the camera glances, accompanied by smiles and mimic laughter. A less obvious but equally telling acknowledgement of the presence of the camera and audience occurs after Charlie writes his note and then turns his back on us to wipe his tears, as if too moved to pretend that the camera did not exist. And by building such references to camera and audience into the tramp, Charlie implies one more, though a much larger circuit of exchange, implies a society from which Charlie is absent but to which Charlie is present, at least for a time. He will leave us as he left the farmer's family, but he leaves behind a rich token of his affection and regard, a circular object which we can unwind and rewind, and which can be passed from hand to hand. Thus, in The Tramp, Charlie transforms nature into culture, himself as tramp into the tramp as text. In so doing, Charlie provides us with a marvelous example of the Metzian dictum that the nature of the cinema is to transform the world into discourse. The aesthetic discourse of the tramp, however, is discourse of a special kind. It draws upon the common language of slapstick comedy, the gags and pratfalls, the cast of almost abstract common characters, the episodic narrative, and from this is fashioned a work which provides us opportunity to reflect upon the most basic human issues. Its rhetoric is primarily a rhetoric of association and exchange, of contrast and juxtaposition. And by making the viewer an implicit part of its associative chain, the tramp allows us to transcend, however briefly, the gap between nature and culture. The tramp as text belongs to both realms of experience. Repressive energies are thus liberated into laughter, but the laughter is not simply and only a disguised form of aggression. It is also and simultaneously a sympathetic laughter, which celebrates the fact that the relationship between nature and culture need not always be antagonistic. Even the farmsteaders come to value Charlie's Tramp, and for that we rightly come to value Chaplin's film. Thank you very much. <laughs>